Welcome to the Cinema Cartography. The sinful actions of a malevolent being are supposed to strike us in such an intense manner that it has the power to cause physical and involuntary reactions. Nevertheless, it's precisely those abhorrent tendencies which makes evil so dangerous, for we can never deny the allure that it also possesses. Evil is a cornerstone of art, and perhaps it's the prime location to greet it, for in art we find our attempts to manifest the immensity of one of the most powerful abstractions of the human condition. To describe evil is factual. To understand evil requires something expressionistic. The modern mythologies of the times have evolved depicting evil as a physical monstrosity, something which paralyzes us with its sheer inhuman presence. One of the major precepts of evil, being that which is hideous within, shall be reflected outward. I am Dracula. Evil has its own iconography, from Goya's Saturn devouring his son, to Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Evil has always sunk its claws into our unconscious, making us visibly aware of its presence, even when trying to hide itself. For if we can say one thing about evil, it's that evil changes things. It can turn a once loving and supporting sister into a heinous reprobate. But when I'm very bad and answer back and sass, then I'm mama's little devil and papa says I've got the brass. It can make a proud businessman transform into a megalomaniacal sociopath isolated from civilized society. You're not my son. Please don't say that. I know you don't mean it. It's the truth. You're not my son. You never have been. You're, no... You're an orphan. It can even bring two people together, both sides of a singular evil. Except for me! No, you don't Who likes me. you except for me? Except for me! You shut up! I'm the only one who likes you! For if evil is a concept, it must have some idiosyncrasies that we may decipher into a language. As we examine through the visual arts to see if we can dissect, even if just to scratch the surface, the aesthetic of evil. This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Try Mubi free for 30 days at mubi.com slash cinemacartography. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash cinemacartography for a whole month of great cinema for free. In Charles Lawton's Night of the Hunter, we see an incessant evil, one with the ability to endlessly pursue the good in the world, manifesting a darkness that represents an overwhelming, and unstoppable force. Off to bed with the both of you. The evil is depicted as the preacher Harry Powell, who after spending time in prison with a man that has hidden $10,000 he's stolen, finishes his own prison sentence with the intention of invading the man's family and finding the money. Night of the Hunter displays evil as a poison that spreads through the entirety of the film, infecting it with blackness. Influenced by German Expressionism, Night of the Hunter utilizes strikingly orchestrated composition and high contrast lighting to convey the encroaching darkness that comes with the arrival of Harry Powell. The world seems to drift into endless dreamlike nightscapes. Darkness becomes a second skin for this film, with shadow playing as a signifier for so much of the power that Harry Powell brings. Oftentimes he's depicted as nothing more than a shadow. More often the outlines of the world are dictated by his overwhelming power as they morph into sharp shapes as though he's able to control the boundaries of our characters' worlds. Making it easier to access them, and signifying that around him, they have no chance of escape. You don't reckon I'd leave you, do you, boy? Well, don't you believe me? Why, sure, boy, sure. Night of the Hunter is a world made up of the black and the white, and the story in many ways is just told through how these two battling elements interplay with one another. 
Light diminishes in the darkness when a villain tells you it's otherwise. It looks like loves but wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hot dog loves a winning. Yes, sir. It's love that won. An old left hand hate is down for the count. Harry Powell is charming and seductive in many ways and demonstrates how evil is able to entrap familial security. He's an ever-present reminder of the evil that exists right on our doorstep, one that even the best of us may succumb to letting in. But the devil wins sometimes. Can't nobody say I didn't do my best to save her. Similarly, we see how in Fanny and Alexander, Ingmar Bergman displays his autobiographical tale by honing in on the transformation of his own family along with the intrusion of his new paternal figure. The world of the new father is without colour, lifeless and empty. His presence is a constant reminder to the children whom he's in constant battle with that regardless of what welcoming nature he feigns, the coldness of his exterior is all around them. So removed are we at this point from the previous life of Alexander, one that was grand and ostentatious, every room filled with the same splendour that mirrored the joy of his life. Now his want for more is reflected on the walls that surround him. For villainy may not make itself immediately present, all it requires is a shattering of the equilibrium to establish something far worse than before. In Fanny and Alexander, the warm that we as viewers crave for from the film's opening is the same sentiment that our protagonists experience. And within the same breath of an evil that can slowly shroud us, it can also be a mighty entity, far too powerful to escape its gaze. The idea of chaos is a prevalent concept in villains. The need to break the said status quo to establish a new vision is a common theme. And for one to perform these things consciously crafts a new type of villain. Perhaps the archetypical character that conveys this sentiment is the Joker, whose themes are best portrayed in The Dark Knight. All you care about is money. This town deserves a better class of criminal. And I'm gonna give it to him. We see an evil that's relentless, primarily because the core function is complete and total anarchy. Whatever order is to be established, no matter who it's under, must be destroyed. As a result, an epoch is created where any rules or codes of conduct are broken. Anything that you anticipate will happen will often result in the opposite. The unpredictability stems from the fact that within that philosophy, they are free to commit any act. The only parameters become what they decide is right and when. And when you're merely the container, the face of an idea, the removal of you does nothing against the cause you fought for. See, madness, as you know, is like gravity. All it takes is a little push. <laughs> and chaos can be manifested in a number of ways, to even bring more chaos in worlds that we believed were chaotic in themselves. In The Wire, our story takes us into the drug war within the streets of West Baltimore. We become submerged through a lawless landscape. Yet only when we believe we've reached the absolute depths of this world do we discover how worse things have the capacity of reaching. At the midway point of the show, the character of Marlowe is introduced. A character who, even within the world of dealing heroin in poverty-stricken areas, is demonstrated to be even too villainous for the villains. I ain't disrespecting you, son. You want it to be one way. What? You want it to be one way. Man, I don't you want, want it to be, be one way. Man, stop! 
Stop saying that. But it's the other way. There are many standout things about Marlow, but perhaps the major one is his demeanour. No matter the situation, if under threat, if imposing himself, Marlow is an evil that remains completely emotionless. I need you to walk back up there and pack up your people. I'm being a gentleman about it for the moment. He's utterly unfazed by any circumstance, as his only purpose within the world is to serve oh, himself, no willing to destroy the equilibrium of any there. facet of the world there is on a whim. Throughout The Wire, it's demonstrated that amongst all levels of society, there's an equivalence, that everyone in some way is connected through a system of beliefs. They're just siphoned through different perspectives. Yet Marlow stands as an entity all on his own, disregarding every unwritten rule that keeps this world in its perpetual state. Prison and graveyards, full of boys who wore the crown. Point is, they wore it. It's my turn to wear it now. The world as it is doesn't suit Marlowe 100%, and nothing will stop his rampage until such a world exists. Manipulating all and ruling by reminding others to obey oh, you, through boy. fear. You too good for my money? Or is you such a bitch ass punk you worried about where my money come from? Marlow is a demonstration that when evil grows, it must change what we define as evil. And it can open doors in the world that often can't be closed yeah, again. Do you know who I am? Nigga, you know who I am? <laughs> if the Joker demonstrates disorganized chaos, and Marlowe is a representative for the inevitable chaos, then we can view the lens of a formulated chaos in the anime Monster and the genre's grandest villain, Johann Liebert. The structure of Monster is colossal in scope, telling a story that spans over two decades across a global scale. And this perfectly echoes the depth of Johann's destructive nature. Johann is a being of pure malevolence, pure in the intensity of this feeling and pure in the clarity of his mindset. Johan only aims to destroy and is well aware of the fact. His demeanour is similar to that of Marlowe's, but it's one of almost angelic peace. Whether it's a want or a need, for Johan, it's not enough to find the absolute pinnacle of methods in destroying an individual, but taking evil to a scale wherein a giant tapestry is weaved, where the evil has become so precise and calculated that entire communities can be infected with his poisonous hatred, managing to turn others into a form of himself. These are just examples of villains that demonstrate the idea of chaos, showing the ability to not only reflect the world we live in, but to morph it to the point of absolute destruction. And here we go. But what about those other evils? The individual people that we may encounter in day-to-day -day life. Ray in Nil by Mouth demonstrates a villain that for many is all too familiar. One whose unmitigated rage bubbles inside of them. Listen, start off that gear. Because this is important. There's a nice few cutting bit off there. All right, mate. When is it? Sunday. When? Sunday. All right, where you go? Whether there will be anything to explain this anger, Ray is an example of a man on the precipice of exploding. His capacity for destruction is always brewing inside of him. Ray is just a man, but he's one to be feared. 
the camera's instability and claustrophobia always placing us within his reach. More often when he's within the scene, he takes up the entirety of the screen, and even if he's not the focus, the film ensures that we're looking at him. Now we are bang on it, yeah. right? We are taking everything. We're taking uppers, downers, yeah, sidewinders, reddies, greenies, blueies, greenies, aren't he fucking genies? Man, We're eating them. They're like smarties. They're going down, right? And we are out. And when we feel the ease of being at a more physical distance from him, the camera is zoomed in, so we're never completely separate, always fearing that one slip up can cause a complete burst of violence. Right. What's going on? What? What's going on? Kubrick liked to display his evils also as something grandiose and physically imposing. When characters were undergoing some type of inner transformation, he would typically have them fill the entire screen, warping their very being. Alex has several sequences where he stares directly at the screen, a very confrontational and powerful gesture, one reminiscent of Norman Bates in Psycho, Throughout the film, we assume Norman's protection of his mother is what will be his downfall, the camera becoming increasingly claustrophobic as he becomes more and more questioned, growing in his own vulnerability. It's not until the film's final revelation, however, that we get one last look at Norman, who looks directly at us. All notions and preconceptions of him have escaped us, as he now appears more threatening than ever. There are instances of an evil being sown as a pathology, present from a younger age. Sometimes this can be as extreme as the house that Jack built, an examination into an evil so intense that there most likely could be nothing done to overcome it. I'm a serial killer, simple. You're weird. I'm weird? Why, because I'm saying that I've killed 61 people. You said 60 However, other instances trace perhaps some thread of hope of better understanding, displaying the hardships of evil within the most normal of settings. In Benny's video, we see the ills of modern society. A boy becomes isolated from the world around him, slipping into a world of screens and artificial media. Should I get to be doing? He murders a young girl in the same manner that he saw a pig slaughtered on a video. Seeing the murder through a screen, we identify that to him, this act is merely an artifact. There's a separation between the reality and the hyperreal, that the act of evil quite possibly to him was not fully manifested. The incessant need to avoid reality is shared by his parents, who amidst all of his known wrongdoings, share the same evasion of the real that made their son commit heinous acts. A similar examination of this comes in We Need to Talk About Kevin. A mother knows about her son's pathology, and even though she remains helpless in it, stays by his side. The suffocation of this kind of evil is displayed only in the world of the mother, who is not only the person on the receiving end of the punishment caused by her son's evil, but trapped within her own mind, constantly reminded of it with the colour red and intense hues always surrounding her, painting the landscape of her every day. But what perhaps defines evil more than anything is that which grants it its power, is its pathology. That which gives evil not only its reasoning, but in the eyes of some, its necessity. In 2001 A Space Odyssey, absolute pragmatism and analysis results in a character which, in cinematic terms, becomes the antagonist, the HAL 9000 computer system. I've still got the greatest enthusiasm and confidence in the mission, and I want to help you. 
Perhaps this is a sardonic take from Kubrick, in that which was manufactured by humans as the pinnacle of an operational system is what, in many ways, becomes the most human character within the film. Hal attributes the capacity of human error as a discrepancy within the species itself, a flaw he doesn't possess, making him superior. And within an objective logic, he is in many ways correct. Are you certain there's never been any case of even the most insignificant computer error? None whatsoever, Frank. Quite honestly, I wouldn't worry myself about that. The humanity that's stripped away from the characters is analogous to them being under the whim of Hal. The setting for the supposed future of humanity at this point is an archetypical, blindingly sterile future, where everything is clean, everything is pure, and nothing can harm. But with this, the grit of life is also removed. All facets of texture and flaws are not present, all else which truly makes us human. Only after escaping from Hal do our characters reclaim some manner of humanity and are cast into a world of colour and splendour. The crux of what could depict Hal as a villain is the unremarkable facet that there is strong reasoning behind the actions he undertakes. This is an ever-present element in the makeup of evil, with many characters even feeling and conveying elements of justification for their actions. In Dark Souls, the nature of the world is dictated by a singular event that holds it within a perpetual cycle. The world is held together by the strength of the first flame, a fire which slowly fades away. But then there was fire, and with fire came disparity. Upon its fading, an age of fire will end, and an age of darkness will reign. Gwyn, the Lord of Lordran, seeking to prolong the age of fire, sacrifices himself to the kiln of the first flame. It's implied in Dark Souls that the natural order of things is to decay and sink into the darkness. The physicality of Dark Souls is a world that's warped, having had its natural order resisted. The world, in many ways, is not dying, it's already dead. Well, what are you going to do? I don't really care. I'm simply crestfallen. It embodies corruption and malevolence, a far cry from what the world was and envisioned to be. Just like the man responsible for the state of the universe, it's merely a hollow husk. Gwyn as a villain is complex, for on one hand he remains the progenitor of a world doomed to exist, shrouded in perpetual evil. Yet in equal measure, this was a decision created out of fear. Indeed, we had felt the warmth of fire, its radiance and the life it sustaineth without fire. All shall be a frigid and frightful dark. Within the exploration of Dark Souls, we learn that Gwyn's sin was a calculated decision, one that's neither right nor wrong, for the multitude of perspectives is shared by the denizens of Lordran, those who feel Gwyn betrayed the sanctity of the universe's natural cycle, and those who view him as an honourable martyr. Yet whether or not any of these people are entirely truthful, remains unknown. Only I know the truth about your fate. You must destroy the fading Lord Gwyn, who has coddled fire and resisted nature, and become the fourth Lord, so that you may usher in an age of dark. Gwyn raises facets that construct the biology of evil the first being the archetype of the tragic villain, those whose villainy stems from injustice or a fall from honour. Mr. Freeze's maniacal attempts at reviving his dead wife seems justifiable and a righteous means to put everyone else he encounters beneath his desires. And in another vein, Macbeth is perhaps the preeminent character associated with the concept of tragedy. His fall from great heights is the most symbolic representation of a tragedy in the Greek sense of the word.
However, some characters are, in their characteristics, innately tragic. Their helplessness makes them pitiful, yet it's also their weakness that makes them dangerous. The character of Rupert Pupkin, from Scorsese's The King of Comedy, is an unaware antagonist. Hey, it's not that big a deal to think. I'm asking you to thinking. just think. I'm thinking. You're always telling me to think. That's all I do is think day and night about it. How can I not think about it? I mean, I've been sitting here at lunch with you, which I knew was the reason you invited me from the first place, and all I'm sitting here and eating for is to get guilty with you, right? I'm asking Pupkin's malevolence comes in his delirium, the blindness towards his own shortcomings. As such, Pupkin is able to manifest a life that he holds in his truest conviction he's deserving of. Jerry, I mean business. Get on the phone. Let's go. The fun is over. This in itself is not an evil thing to do. Some argue that in certain circumstances, that a dream or a goal may be achieved by any means necessary. However, looking at Pupkin through his eyes and through those of an objective spectator, we see precisely why the actions of a person may be seen as sad, but we must never forget that weakness very easily begets evil. Right now, Jerry is strapped to a chair somewhere in the middle of this city. <laughs> Well, go ahead and laugh, thank you, I appreciate it. But the fact is, I'm here. The other facet raised within Gwyn was a self-imposed sense of duty. The idea that evil can simply be a task that one must do. The character Eamon Goeth from Schindler's List is a depiction of a real historical character, but his portrayal in many ways adds a layer of human depth to the man. Goeth never takes joy in what he does, yet he never dismisses it either. It's merely work, the most mundane and mechanical of tasks. Herr Kommandant, I'm only trying to do my job. Yeah, I'm doing mine. From the psychological perspective, we can view this based on the character's cognition. It may not be a learned experience or a predisposition for Goeth to commit atrocities, it's solely on the cognitive level. The beliefs and values that Goeth holds is what grants the aura of evil. For him, these things are not the way he wants them to be. For him, these are simply the way things are. For six centuries, there has been a Jewish placa. Think about that. By this evening, those six centuries are a rumor. They never happened. For what precisely is evil? Is it a place that we venture to? Is it the physical manifestation of our shadow? Is it goodness corrupted? Does anything even have to change for evil to arrive? In Hanukkah's The White Ribbon, unexplainable and violent events begin to occur within a small time frame, with seemingly no cause. A piece of wire tumbles a man from his horse, a house sets on fire, a disabled child is kidnapped and beaten. Toward the finale of the film, one of the women reveals that she knows exactly who has been responsible for the acts within the village. Yet upon her leaving, she's never seen again. Sofort ärgerte ich mich, das Fahrrad verborgt zu haben. Aber der Zustand der Frau, die ich als besonnen kannte, hatte mich beeindruckt. Was hatte sie von ihrem Sohn erfahren, dass sie niemandem mitzuteilen wagte? The White Ribbon suspends us in anticipation, waiting to find a joining piece for the enigma it creates. Yet it never does so. Evil here does not change the setting per se, it keeps it inert existing forever in a town seemingly trapped in time. Hanukkah's choice to shoot the film in a sombre black and white, suggesting an emphasis on this point all the more. There's nothing within the white ribbon that becomes altered other than the mood of the town. Perhaps evil snuck its way in unnoticed, or perhaps it's always been with us, remaining dormant, until it's called upon. The white ribbon suggests that evil is an abstraction, reflective of the collective consciousness of a society. Whatever the present normative values are of the world that surrounds us, they will be unknowingly enacted 
by its people. This is. Sie in den österreichischen Tonfolge erschossen in Sarajevo. If anything has been shown in these examples, is that evil is manifested in a number of ways and shown to us in even more. For evil personified can be something far more ethereal, something that we don't know where the cause emerged from or if it was always there, like paranoia agent, where a collective mania seems to manifest itself in the image of a pursuant and mysterious young boy. The Witch by Robert Eggers deals with a very similar idea. We're shown from the opening scene that a witch does exist. There's no question from the perspective of the viewer as to whether this world would even have the capacity in creating an otherworldly evil. Our characters exist in an environment where the landscape utterly envelops them, with towering trees and foliage making them look like the unnatural ones there. But what the witch demonstrates is that even when there is a known evil out there, it's still often inwards that our own shadow is directed, unaware that we are manifesting something much greater. Well, I'll read out a chapter of the word tonight. We must find some light in our darkness. Tomorrow we will have a fast day, but for our sins. The younger children torment the animals. The parents abandon their responsibilities of the daughter, using her as the pyre to cast their hatred and the son disbands from the family and finds solace in the witch herself. For people are often in tune with their world, even if their world is toxic. In Bellatar's Werkmeister Harmonies, the evil is the collective. A circus attraction arrives in a Hungarian town, and while one naive man is entranced by the beauty of it, everyone else within the town slowly harbours a resentment, which brews until it escalates into explosions of violence. There's nothing that would quantify the citizens of the town to fear the attraction, however it seems that their mind is already made up. The fear of the unknown in many ways a cry for people to reclaim power over their own dominion. Power exercised through the brute force over the most vulnerable. Evil penetrates the world silently in Werkmeister harmonies and spreads like a virus. Upon returning time and time again to parts of the world, during our absence, they grew more volatile and larger in scale. Yet simultaneously, nothing about the world had changed. Nothing other than their perspectives. The evil of Werkmeister harmonies is the collective paranoia that things are to be conserved precisely as they are that a person need not change nor acknowledge their own vulnerabilities. If any type of suggestion were to be made, then the world may as well be destroyed, lest an ignorant man be exposed. We are told that many things of the human condition are abstractions, and this is true, yet we must not confuse this, for those abstractions remain very, very real. Evil does in fact change things, it's a boundless force and anything in contact with it shall warp, transpose and shift into a thing often far more heinous than we can comprehend. In art, the aesthetic of evil is a nuanced perspective of but one examination of deep-seated human malice. Evil can live inside of us, it can emerge directly in front of our eyes, it can live in our home. Art presents these varying elements to us in a variety of ways, for evil needs a place to dwell, and it can search persistently until it materialises exactly how and when it needs to. It can be in the spirit of those that are supposed to protect us, 
it can be the realisation that the evil is in fact us. But what the aesthetic of evil displays in totality is that we still admire the things evil can bring to the world. In art, as is in life, the nature of evil is to lure us in, to look at it and think, perhaps, what if? We'd like to thank Mubi for sponsoring this video. Mubi is a curated streaming service, an ever-changing collection of hand-picked films from new directors to award winners from everywhere on earth. Beautiful, interesting, incredible movies and a new one every single day, always chosen by Mubi curators. You can stream or download all of Mubi's movies anytime, on any screen, any device, anywhere, and you'll never see a single ad on Mubi. Right now you can check the Mubi library, a section where you can discover hundreds of great films that have been handpicked by Mubi's curators. Right now on Mubi UK, you can check out Bacorao by Klebe Mendonça Filho, but there are many more brand new releases that you can find exclusively on Mubi. You can try Mubi for free for 30 days at mubi.com slash cinemacartography. That's mubi.com slash cinemacartography for a whole month of great cinema for free.